this morning we are continuing to answer the question, what do disciples do? What do disciples do? And we're addressing the question from John chapter 1 where Jesus was calling the original 12 disciples to himself. So it's in these verses that we can pinpoint some very simple but practical actions that Christians do that lead to a vibrant, wonderful, growing, exciting Christian life. Now, as we're setting everything up for this morning, I am going to give you a quote, I'm going to share a story, and I'm going to come back and give that quote again, okay? So here's the quote, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. When Christ calls a man. He bids him come and die. That is a quote from Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He was a pastor and a theologian who died as a martyr in Germany in 1945. Some of you might have heard of Dietrich Bonhoeffer before. Some of you might have even read his seminal work that's called The Cost of Discipleship. But it's very difficult for me to talk about discipleship or about following Jesus for any period of time and not talk about Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And the reason for that is much of our understanding of discipleship today was pioneered by this man in a time in which it was not advantageous for anyone to talk about a deep commitment to Christ. So if you've not already picked up a copy or read that book, I would encourage everyone in the room to find a copy of The Cost of Discipleship by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Very small book, very quick read, but it is well worth the time. So if you were to understand this idea about discipleship and about how we share it, and I'm talking about Bonhoeffer from the very beginning, I want you to know a part of his story as to why what he writes on the subject is so absolutely important. So his biography gives far more information, a lot of the life events that shared how profound his teachings were, but let me give you a snapshot of his life. Bonhoeffer was raised in a liberal, nominally religious household. At the age of 14, he told his parents that he wanted to be a pastor and a theologian to which they were not overly excited. He graduated from the University of Berlin in 1927, spent several months in Spain as an assistant pastor of a German-speaking congregation. He went back to Germany to write a dissertation. Then he spent the following year in New York at Union Theological Seminary before returning again to Germany. Germany as a lecturer at the University of Berlin. It was during these years that Hitler's rise to power and his anti-Semitic language and actions began to intensify. It led Karl Barth as well as Pastor Martin Niemöller as well as Dietrich Bonhoeffer to start what was referred to as the Confessing Church. In a time in which Christians should have been speaking out against evil and hatred, many Christians had run to the safe place of silence. So Dietrich Bonhoeffer, in 1937, he wrote this book called The Cost of Discipleship. And it was a radical call for obedience to Christ as well as it was a severe rebuke of what was referred to as comfortable Christianity. Listen to this quote. Cheap grace is preaching forgiveness without requiring repentance. Baptism without church discipline. Communion without confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship. Grace without the cross. Grace without Jesus Christ, both living and incarnate. End of quote. He began to teach these truths about discipleship and about really standing and following Christ. Even if it's not advantageous, he began to teach this to a number of pastors in an underground seminary. And once it was found out, it was very quickly shut down. As the threats intensified, those of the confessing church became more and more reluctant to speak out against the evil that was taking place by Hitler. Bonhoeffer continued to press in and to oppose the Nazis both through religious action as well as moral persuasion. He signed up, get this, as a German secret agent. And that is, his assignment was to go to church conferences all throughout Europe and to gather intel on specific cities and report back. But instead of him doing that, he would travel around and use it as an opportunity to release Jews from Nazi oppression. As it was found out that he was a part of the resistance movement, he was placed in prison in 1943, spent the next two years in prison writing letters back and forth to friends and family. He also pastored some fellow believers in prison. And get this, he wrote about what is Jesus Christ for today? 
That was his focus in his writing. How does Jesus change my life today? On April the 9th, 1945, one month before Germany surrendered, he was hanged with six other resistors at an extermination camp in Flossenburg, Germany. A doctor who witnessed his execution said this, and I quote, Through the half-open door, I saw Pastor Bonhoeffer kneeling on the floor, praying fervently to his God. At the place of execution, he again said a prayer, and then he climbed the steps to the gallows, brave and composed. His death ensued in a few seconds. In almost 50 years that I have worked as a doctor, I've hardly ever seen a man die so entirely submissive to the will of God. End of quote. When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. You can fill churches and worship services if all you do is teach about everything we get from God. And there's a lot of stuff we get. We get eternal life, we get forgiveness. We get grace. We, we get to experience God's mercy. We get heaven when we die. I mean, listen, I'm one of those people. I love to hear about all we get by virtue of our relationship with God through Jesus Christ. That's wonderful. But the Christian life is not only about what you get. It is also about what it costs to follow Christ. For Dietrich Bonhoeffer and millions of other believers around the world, it cost them their life. For others, it cost them their freedom. Others, it cost them their homes. Others, it cost them their jobs. Others, it cost them their future that they planned. So here's the thing I want you to see. As believers in America, we have been unbelievably blessed by God not to have to endure some of the persecution that our brothers and sisters in Christ have endured around the world for 2,000 years. But that does not mean that our following Christ is not to cost us something. Here's what we find as you dig into what it means to follow Christ. Every believer, regardless of generation, regardless of where they live, regardless of when they live in history, here's what it's going to cost every believer. It costs you everything. It will cost you your will. It will cost you your way. It will cost you the momentary pleasures of a world that has gone mad trying to fill itself. To follow Jesus is going to cost you something. But let me also be very quick to say the benefits far outweigh the cost. In fact, this is what Jesus said. If anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross daily and follow me. Bonhoeffer's words... We're in line with what Jesus was sharing. When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. That has died to self. That has died to your right to demand your rights. It has died to those things because you are now following another. So today, as we continue to answer this question, what do disciples do? I want to make sure that we really dig into what does it look like to follow Christ? There's a lot that is coming in this message this morning. You're going to find out that to follow Jesus is far more than just being a fan of Jesus. It's far more than just liking some of his teachings. It's far Far more than giving him a shout out occasionally on social media. To follow Jesus, listen to this, to follow Jesus is radical submission of your life to another. You're going to hear this word submission and submit all the way through this. That's a part of what it looks like to follow Christ. Now, I know everybody's excited about that intro. Tell me, let's submit. All right, so let's just get into this. It's going to be good. So I invite you, go with me in your Bibles to John chapter 1, verses 35 through 51. John chapter 1, 35 through 51. I'm sharing the second half of the message this morning on what do disciples do. As we get into this text, let's just pray. Just settle our spirits. Just get into flow of what God's doing and see what God will share this morning. Heavenly Father, we're excited today about what you're going to share. God, may hearts be open. May our spiritual antenna be up, and we be ready to receive what it is that you have to share from your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. So last week, we began our study of John 1, 35 through 51, and it's in these verses that it outlines the calling of the first five of the original 12 disciples of Jesus Christ. And we're asking the question, based on that original Genesis moment of discipleship, what do disciples do? What is entailed in following Christ. 
So our question last week was very simple. On a practical level, not a theoretical level, not a hypothetical level, a practical level, what do disciples do? And last week we had one basic truth. Disciples know Jesus. That's where we were at all of last week. That foundational insight is key to everything in the Christian life. Because if you don't know him, you won't love him. If you don't know him, you won't follow him. If you don't know him, you won't obey him. If you don't know him, you won't trust him. So if you remove loving Jesus, following Jesus, obeying Jesus, and trusting Jesus, take that out of the Christian life, there is no Christian life left. That's, that's what it means. It is part of what it means to be a disciple. Everything flows out of disciples knowing Jesus, knowing his heart, knowing him as Savior, as Lord, knowing his attributes, knowing his character, knowing his mission. All of those things are part of what it no means to know Jesus. So this week, we ask the same question. On a practical level, what do disciples do? And here's our next one. Disciples follow Jesus. Disciples follow Jesus. Very simple. Look at it in the verses. Verse 37. It says, the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Verse 38. And Jesus turned and saw them following. Verse 40. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Verse 43. And Jesus said to him, follow me. Four times in that little collection of verses, it either mentions the fact that the disciples were following Jesus or Jesus was inviting a disciple to follow him. Disciples follow Jesus. Now, just like last week, our original big truth we're dealing with, it sounds so unbelievably simplistic on the surface that it almost be like, you know what, I already know that. Let's go on to some other things. But the more you understand what it meant to follow Jesus or to follow a rabbi in that time is the more we begin to unlock what it is that disciples actually do. So when we think about following Jesus, our mind usually thinks about Jesus is leading, we're coming from behind, Jesus is walking, and we're kind of coming behind him. So it's kind of like Jesus is going from point A to point B. We're going to follow along behind him. And there is a part of that that is absolutely a part of what it means to follow Christ. But there's also something a whole lot more deep that's involved here. Far more than it's simply being about navigation, getting from point A to point B, it's ultimately about transformation. This is in your notes. From a first century Jewish perspective, to follow a rabbi was to become like that rabbi. To follow a rabbi was to become like that rabbi. Now, I've shared some of this information with you all before several years ago. We've written some of this down in one of our discipleship books called The Journey. It's also been shared by a number of other pastors. But I want you to understand for just a moment the significance of what it actually means to follow Christ. Some people have read the gospel accounts and they'll come to these original disciples and they'll talk about the fact that they were fishermen and Jesus said, follow me, and they dropped their nets and walked off. And somebody's like, how does a grown man just like leave his livelihood and just start following somebody because they said, follow me? Well, as you understand a first century Jewish perspective, you now understand why these men would do exactly what they did. So here's the background. First century Jewish education had three primary levels. Children began their study at ages five or six in what was referred to as Beit Sefer, which means house of the book. Beit Sefer, it looks like Beth Sefer, but the H is actually silent. It is Beit Sefer, house of the book. It's in this time that the primary focus was on the first five books that are sitting in your Bible. That is referred to as Torah. They were to study Torah. It was reported that on the first day that these children would arrive to learn from a rabbi, their rabbi would take honey and cover their writing slate in honey. And then that rabbi would say, lick the honey off the slate and off your fingers. And as they licked the honey is when he would quote Psalm 119, 103. May the words of God be sweet to your taste, sweeter than honey to your mouth. The rabbi wanted these young children to know from an early age 
That there is nothing more enjoyable than knowing and tasting and receiving and living with the Word of God. For the next four to five years, these young children would memorize large portions of the first five books of the Bible. In fact, many of the children, by the time they finished five years later, they would have memorized verse by verse, word by word, the first five books of your Bible in their entirety. Sometimes parents tell me today, my kids can't memorize scripture. No, they're going to memorize something. The question is, what are you giving them to memorize? They've been memorizing scripture for a long time. So it was around the age of 10 that these children would transition out of Bates Affair, and there was only a handful that were really able to do it in its entirety, to memorize things at that level. Many of them would finish their education at that time. A lot of times the parents wanted to make sure their children were prepared for the future in two primary ways. They wanted them to have a firm theological understanding, and they also wanted them to be trained for a vocation. So if a child was struggling with this, they were like, okay, you've got a foundation. It's now time for you to come back into the family business. I want you to learn a vocation. For those who excelled in this, they would continue to the next level of Jewish education while at the same time learning and being trained in a vocation. So the next step was referred to as Beit Talmud, that is house of learning. It's in Beit Talmud that the expectations were greatly intensified. They would then, in this level of education, they would study the prophets, they would study the writings, in addition to continuing to study the Torah. They also learned about the interpretations of the oral Torah, that is the legal and interpretive traditions. They learned how to interpret and how to apply scripture. They also learned the Jewish art of answering a question by asking a question. Now let me share with you why this is important. The second level of Jewish education focused on critical thinking skills to make sure, does this kid actually understand it or are they just parroting back to me the same thing I told them? If you think about how Western education is set up, Western education for the most part is a teacher gives information and that student is required to give the same information back. So if we were to teach something as simple as the addition tables, we would teach 2 plus 2 equals 4. Then they would get onto a test and they would say, what does 2 plus 2 equal? And you are hoping the student would say 4 based on memorizing the information that has been shared. But what this was focused on is making sure somebody actually could understand it and they knew they understood it if they gave the right answer in the form of a question. So if the rabbi were to say, what is two plus two, instead of getting four, a student might say, what is eight minus four? Or what is 25% of 16? If they could give the answer in the form of a question, the rabbi knew this kid understands not only the answer, they're just not giving me back something I gave them, they actually understand what I'm asking. So if a student could give that back, then the rabbi knew that they understood the information. Now, it's interesting because we have a story of Jesus at the age of 12. It was not one of the better parenting moments for Joseph and Mary because they lost their kid. They lost Jesus in the temple. But basically, here's what happened when they found him in the temple in Luke chapter 246. It says, they found him in the temple sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. All he was doing was asking them questions. They're saying they're astonished at his understanding and answers. The reason is because by asking the question, he was showing his understanding. So basically, that's where Jesus was at the age of 12. At the end of Beit Talmud, get this, at the end of Beit Talmud, some students... A minority of students would have finished memorizing the rest of your Old Testament. 39 books, word by word by word. Parents tell me their kids can't memorize Scripture. No, they can memorize Scripture. 
So at the end of this time, as you might imagine, many kids struggled to memorize all the rest of this. But what would happen is those who could do it, the best of the best, they would go on to the next level of Jewish education. The other students, they would simply begin to learn the family trade. They would get into the family business. So on the next level, it was what was referred to as Beit Midrash. That is house of study. The moment a child... And the moment a young man entered this, they were referred to as Talmudim, which is where we get the term disciple from. So at this level, a student would come to a rabbi and they would say, Rabbi, I want to be one of your Talmudim. I want to be one of your disciples. Can I enter into your house of study? And at that moment, the rabbi would begin asking this young man questions to find out, does he understand the basics? So instead of asking questions like, you know, what are the first five books of the Bible? Or who was found in the lion's den? Instead, the rabbi would ask questions like, there are four references to Deuteronomy in the book of Habakkuk. Give them to me in order. How many of you could do that right now? Okay, here's another one. They would also engage in what was referred to as remiz. And that is, a rabbi would simply quote a verse and talk about a subject. And in that moment, the student had to know if the verse applied to the subject or if it was the subject connected to the verse before it or the verse after it. So without any scripture in front of them, they had to know the verse, the surrounding verses, the context of the verses, and then tell if that verse was quoted properly for interpretation. Can you do that? Okay, so again, the rabbi wanted to find out what does this kid know? Do they understand Torah? Do they understand the oral traditions? Do they understand interpretation? And here's what they really wanted to get down to. They wanted to know, could this student understand my approach to scripture? And could they eventually teach that to somebody else? A rabbi's approach to scripture was referred to as their yoke. You remember what Jesus said, take my yoke upon you. My understanding of Scripture, he said, for my understanding of Scripture is easy and my burden is light. That was Jesus describing that same yoke. So this rabbi wanted to know, can this young guy understand my teaching? And as a result, can they go through and teach this to others? So from that point, if the rabbi felt like they could actually understand it, here's what the rabbi would say. Come, follow me. Each time you see Jesus say, follow me, you now understand the significance of why these people would have left their homes, left their livelihoods, walked away from their business, because for someone to actually be accepted by a rabbi was one of the most amazing opportunities they could ever experience. It was an incredible honor that someone felt as if they were worthy enough to be their Talmudim, their disciples. Now, by the way, where did Jesus find this group? They didn't come up to him asking. They were working. In other words, they didn't make it past that second level of Jewish education. So now it's like they get a second chance at something they never thought would have the opportunity to begin with. There is now a rabbi who is saying, would you come and follow me? In other words, this is the B team. That they didn't even start on Jesus' squad. It's like the second string. And he's saying, come, be my disciples. Now, from this moment, the goal of whoever that disciple was was incredibly simple. He wanted to be like his rabbi. That's it. And when we talk about be like his rabbi, here's what we find in Scripture. Luke 9.40 says, students are not greater than their teacher or rabbi, but students who are fully trained will become like the teacher or the rabbi. So the disciples, they would mimic everything their rabbi did, everything the rabbi did. So for example, if the rabbi ate only certain foods, they would change their diet to only eat those certain foods. If the rabbi were to sleep in a weird position, all of his disciples would begin to sleep in that same weird position. It was said in history that there were rabbis who walked with a limp. And as they would walk through town, all of their disciples would walk with a limp behind them. 
Because the goal of the disciple was to be like their rabbi. Now, from this point right here, can you already understand why it is that many of our discipleship attempts fail? Because we look at discipleship simply as there is a student who is a learner. And if there's a student, the student simply wants to know what the teacher knows to give the right answer. Because you all know as well as I do, after the test is done, we're like, I don't need that information anymore. Okay, so for students, that's not their goal necessarily. But for a disciple, it was not just can you know the information to give the right answer. For a disciple who is truly following this model, the desire was I want to know the information so that I can do the right thing, so that I can become like my rabbi in every step of the way. So that being said, that's what it's talking about with following Christ. So when we say the disciples follow Christ, Jesus. It's more than just navigation from point A to point B. It's about transformation. It is about are you willing to live in a way so that you become like your rabbi. Now, that being said, here are four basic implications to live out these teachings. First is this. Following Jesus is personal. It's personal. People can tell you about Christ. They can point you towards Christ. They can encourage you to follow Christ. They can pray that you would follow Christ. They can share what Christ has meant to them. They can try to answer some of your questions about Christ. But at the end of the day, no one can follow Jesus for you. I talked to a young man years ago, and I asked him if he was a Christian. And he said, yes. And I was like, tell me why you believe you're a Christian. And here's his exact response. My grandmother worked for the Salvation Army. Did you see what he just did? Basically, he was trying to be a follower by proxy. He was trying to say, because my grandmother has been associated with a religious Christian-based organization, that now makes me a Christian. Listen, no one can follow Jesus for you. In this situation, every single one of these disciples had someone else point Jesus out to them, but there was a moment in which it went from being pointed out to them to them actually following Christ themselves. I wrote this in my notes. This is a good word. Jesus observed is not Jesus received. Let me explain that. There's a lot of people who have been observing Jesus for a long time. They can tell you the stories. They've sat in the churches. They have sung the songs. They have been a great admirer of Jesus and his life and his teachings and what he stood for. But they have been observing. Jesus observed is not Jesus received. There has to be a time in which what you have observed has taken over you to the point you're saying, I am willing to surrender everything that I might follow him, that I might follow Christ. No one can follow Jesus for you. Here's the next one. Following Jesus is comprehensive. Jesus does not want to just be a great addition to your life. He wants to become your life. That is exactly what Paul taught believers in Colossae. He said, when Christ, who is our life, has appeared. Not when Christ, who is a part of what we do on Sunday mornings, Our Christ, who I pray to every third Thursday, but rather when Christ, who is our life, has appeared. Following Jesus is not a Sunday thing. It's not a religious thing. It's not a philosophical thing. It is not a morality thing. It is a life thing. We follow him with every aspect of our life, with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our strength, with all of our might. That sounds unbelievably comprehensive. Can I tell you what happens in Christianity today that leads to a lot of people never experiencing the abundant Christian life because? Here it is. They try to compartmentalize Jesus in the spiritual part of their life. Like, Jesus, you stay over there. Spiritual, it's like we got some Bible reading, we got some prayer, we got some church, we got a little bit of singing. That's the spiritual part of my life. 
But then they have a work life, and they got a family life, and they got a hobby life, and they've got all these other things. And like, Jesus, you stay there. I'm going to run the show over here. By the way, Jesus would be a whole lot nicer in how he says this, but he is not coming in to take over part of your life. He's coming to take over all of your life. That is every aspect. He wants to be so a part of your life that he is a part of every decision. He is a part of how you think. He's a part of how you act. You become like your rabbi. So therefore, if Jesus were to love people in this situation, guess what you're called to do? Love them in that situation. If Jesus is to serve in some of the most demeaning ways by washing somebody's feet, basically what he's saying is, you saw my lead, you're going to follow me. If you want to be like me, you need to step in and follow in this way. See, as long as we try to say, God, you can come this far in my life and no further, I'll give you a promise. You will never experience the abundant Christian life. This thought came to me this morning talking about the cost of following Christ. Here's the thought that came. There is a cost that accompanies the call to follow Christ. But the cost is to release the very things that would interfere with you experiencing your created potential. In other words, think about it in this way. Let's say someone got an honor of being able to represent their country in the Olympics. What a great honor that would be. But you know what that's going to require? That you follow a very strict dietary regulation. That's going to require that you have some training that is going to be intense. It's going to require that you can do things and you can't do certain things. So basically what they're saying is to fully experience this, we are going to, here it is, have a cost that causes you to actually reach your potential. In other words, by eating the right thing, by training the right way, by acting the right way, you will be the most prepared to experience the fullness of whatever it is that you're being called to do within the Olympics. Jesus is doing the same thing. He's like, listen, the same things that I'm asking you to lay down are the same things that interfere with you experiencing your created potential in Christ. Here's the next one. Following Jesus is living submitted. That is denying self, personal obedience, recognizing lordship. Now, the concept of following necessitates a willingness to submit. I know that's deep thought, but let's go back one more time. The concept of following necessitates a willingness to submit. In other words, you cannot lead and follow at the exact same time. And by the way, he's not giving you the option of taking his place. He didn't say, anyone who would like to step out that I could follow them. Instead, he says, if anyone desires to follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow. So there is a necessity in which if we are going to follow Christ, we are living in a submitted state. We are living under the lordship of Christ. We are living with our yes on the table to whatever it is Jesus is telling us to do before he tells us to do it. We're not waiting until the situation arises and we're like, all right, God, give us all the details. Let me find out how much it's going to cost. And if I'm willing to pay the cost, then I'll say yes to this. Somebody who is living in a submitted state, they simply say, God, the yes is on the table regardless of the cost. It doesn't matter what you're asking of me. It doesn't matter where you're calling me to. It doesn't matter what you're asking me to do in this situation. I know at the end of the day, my goal is to become like Jesus, to become like my rabbi. And if my rabbi says, this is the path, that's the path for me. No questions asked. So, Again, we're talking about what do you do in order to experience the vibrant, growing, incredible relationship with God? Here it is. Live submitted. Live with the yes on the table. Here's the following one, and we close out. Following Jesus changes our identity. Following Jesus changes our identity. In verse 42, we see on a very small scale a principle that is actually lived out by all believers on a much larger scale. It says, Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John. 
You shall be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. I love the fact Jesus never even asked permission to rename this dude. I mean, it's like, hey, um, I'm not going to call you by that, so I'm going to rename you. Like, that's opening conversation that's happening over here. Okay? So anyway, this idea here, Cephas is the Aramaic word for rock. That's the same word that is translated in Greek as Peter. Now, by nature, this is so cool, by nature, Simon was brash, and he was vacillating, and he was undependable. Simon was the guy who would make a promise and just not follow through. He did it a couple times to Jesus. Simon was the guy who would jump into a situation only to look back and figure out what I just jumped into. I mean, he, he literally epitomized what James 1.8 says, a double-minded man who was unstable in all of his ways. So as best we can tell, Jesus changed Simon's name because he wanted the new name to be a perpetual reminder of who he was to become in Christ. Over time, Jesus would transform him into his name. Now, think about it like this. From this point going forward, it's a cool study. I encourage you to do it in your own time. From this point going forward, each time Jesus specifically would call him Simon, it was either a reference to his old life, his old business, his old city, or it was when Simon was acting according to his unregenerate old self. So, in other words... When Simon would get in trouble, that's when Jesus would say, Simon. Do you remember the moment whenever he said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to sift you like wheat, but I've prayed for you that your faith fail you not, and when you are returned, strengthen your brethren. He called him Simon. Now, remember, the goal of the disciple was to become like their rabbi. So there's this other situation that takes place in the Garden of Gethsemane whenever Peter and James and John, they're with Jesus, and basically Jesus is saying, pray with me, and Jesus goes off to pray, and if they're going to be like their rabbi, what should they be doing? Praying, okay? So they come back, and they're asleep, and here's what Jesus says, Simon, are you sleeping? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray lest you enter temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Anytime Simon needed a subtle rebuke, Jesus would just say, Simon. I, I wonder how many times he would say Simon, and Simon would cringe thinking, would you just call me rock? Would you call me who you want me to be? And I wonder how many times in this backside conversation that Jesus would say, I'll call you rock when you start acting like a rock. Right now, you're still acting like old Simon. So to make sure you understand that's not who you've been called to be, when you're doing something wrong, I'm going to call you out on it. I'm going to call you Simon. Now, here's the point. When God saved every single one of us, if you're a follower of Christ, when he saved you, you got a new identity in Christ. You are a new creation in Christ. You are a new creature in Christ. That means he gave you a new mind. He gave you his spirit. He gave you new power and authority that only comes from being rightly related to him. When he looks at you, he looks at you according to who he has called you to be. That way, whenever he says you are saints of God, he also knows you're still sinning. But the issue is not the sin that defined you in the past, but rather he is calling you to live up to the position that he's made for you here in the present. That means he is looking at you no longer saying you're this messed up bad person over here, but rather he says you're my child. You're a part of the king of kings, the Lord of lords. You're part of the family of God. You have been given much grace and I'm sharing this with you so that you live up to who you are in Christ. You get an identity change as you follow Jesus. Now let's bring all of this back together as we close, to follow Christ is more than just showing up for church. It's more than giving him an occasional shout out on social media. To follow Jesus is to become like Jesus. There is a cost that comes with this. As Dietrich Bonhoeffer very clearly shared, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. In other words, 
You can't live for self and walk with Jesus simultaneously. Either you will be living according to your old nature, that is that fleshly nature, or you're living according to who he has made you to be in Christ. My question for you is, are you following him? Not are you a fan, are you following him? Is your heart's desire, God, make me like Christ. May I become like Jesus. I'm going to ask you, if you would, to bow for a word of prayer as we close out. I didn't do it in the other two services. I, I feel the Spirit leading in this way for right now. Here's what I want to do. If somebody is recognizing this morning that they are not following Christ in that way, they've tried to section Christ off to the side, to compartmentalize Christ, what I want to do at the very, at the very beginning, I want to pray over you. I want to pray that God would give you the courage to just say, God, come through every door, come through every window, come through every crevice, every crack, every place that I have not allowed you to take over my life entirely. God, I give that to you right now. So I'm going to pray for that group. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we're asking for boldness. We're asking, God, that we would not be willing to sit on the sidelines and just watch the glory of the Christian life pass before us. God, may we be engaged in the battle. May we experience the fullness of the abundant life that's promised by you in John 10.10. 10. So, Lord, I pray today that whatever it takes to break through doors and to walk into all the areas of our life, God, may we willingly submit because we know one way or the other, you will get what you desire because no plan of yours is gonna be thwarted. But sometimes you have to walk us through the hard times and give us difficult lessons to break us of ourselves so that we would be willing to submit fully and to follow you. God, I plead your mercy over this group right now, asking in this moment, may you not have to break down the door, but may we open it willingly because we understand the importance of what it is that you are offering. So God, thank you. Thank you in advance for changing hearts and totally encompassing all of who we are. So here's the second group I want to pray for. I want to pray for people right now that they know that they are not followers of Christ as it's been defined today. They recognize that they have liked his teachings, but there's never been that moment in which he has become personal to them. But they want that this morning. So I want to pray for that person. If your desire is that you're not living vicariously through somebody else, but rather following Jesus has now become personal for you. It is a thing that you desire to do. I want to pray over you at this time. I want you to pray a very simple prayer. This is in your heart, this is between you and God, but the prayer is just simply like this. God, I know I've sinned, and God, there's no way I can change that. I pray at this moment, would you completely transform my life? I believe that you died on the cross, I believe you rose from the dead on the third day. I believe somehow, I don't even know how, but you want a relationship with me, so God, would you give me that today? Give me eternal life. With heads bowed, eyes still closed, you've seen today at the beginning of the service people who have prayed that prayer and they've taken a step forward in, in being baptized, but today there might be some that are in the room that you just prayed with me at this time. And if you did, would you just slip your hand up really quick and then put it down? Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Hands going around. Praise God, thank you. you may put them down. Heavenly Father, we thank you for those who today are saying, I want to follow. I don't want to be a fan. I don't want to follow from a distance. I want to be in the game. So God, may you give them incredible courage to continue to follow all of us that next step. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.